Hello learners, uh, I'm Dr. Vanita Anand from Maharaja Surajmal Institute and today we would be discussing the type and trait theory of personality. So let's begin. Uh, you must have studied about a number of theories and today one of the very important theories that is type and trait theory of personality would be discussed. So let us first of all talk about the type theory. Type theories basically advocate that human personalities can be classified into clear, well-defined types. That is, we can distribute people into different types which are well-defined. Now, this classification is based on the person's behavioral characteristics, somatic structure, blood types and fluids in the body. That is, on the basis of how a person looks or what kind of fluids are there in abundance or the blood types, Various psychologists have divided people into a number of types. So first of all, there is a classification given by Hippocrates. Now this is based on the dominance of fluids in the body, that is, which particular kind of fluid is present in the body. Based on that, we talk about the name of the personality type assigned by Hippocrates, and then we talk about the temperamental characteristics. So first of all, sanguine, this is the name of the personality type. These people have dominance of which fluid? It is blood. And what are the temperamental characteristics of sanguine people? They are light-hearted, happy, hopeful, very, very optimistic and accommodating. The second type is choleric. Now, who are these people? What kind of fluid they have in their body in abundance? This is yellow bile. And what are the temperamental characteristics? They are irritable, angry, but they are passionate and strong with active imagination. And the third type is melancholic. These people have black bile in abundance. They are bad tempered, most of the times dejected, sometimes sad, sometimes depressed, deplorable, pessimistic and self-involved. And the last one is abundance of phlegm in the body. These are known as phlegmatic people. They are cold, calm, indifferent, slow, and mostly sluggish. Now, the another kind of classification is given by Kreshmer. He has based his classification on biological types, which are based on physical structure. That is how the person looks like. What are the physical structure characteristics? So first of all, there are picnic. This is the name of the personality type. And what kind of bodies? They have fat bodies. Characteristics? They are jolly, sociable, good-natured, easy-going, happy-go-lucky, you know, very happy sort of people. So then we have a balanced body type also. And what is the name? Athletic. They are energetic, optimistic, adjustable. And finally, in this category, we have the last one is leptosomatic. These people are lean, thin. And the characteristics? Unsociable, reserved shy, they are sensitive and mostly pessimistic. Another classification that is given to us is by Sheldon. Now in this, he has given a very clear classification of endomorph, mesomorph and ectomorph. Again, this is based on somatic description. By endomorphic people, he says those people who have highly developed viscera, viscera means internal organs, but weak somatic structure. These people are easygoing, sociable, affectionate, and then comes mesomorphic people. They have balanced development of both viscera as well as somatic structure. And their characteristics are craving for muscular activity, mostly sportsmen, self-assertive. They love risk taking. They love to take adventures, lots of adventurous activities they would engage in. So these are mesomorphic people, that is well-developed bodies. And finally, we have ectomorphic people. They have weak somatic structure as well as undeveloped viscera. Now, these people are pessimistic, unsociable and reserved. Now, the last classification is given by Jung. And what does this classification say? He used basically four kinds of psychological functions to divide people into various types. So first of all, he says we can see people based on thinking and feeling, that is rational functions. What kind of rationality, whether they think from brain or heart and all that. Second classification is sensation and intuition. These he called irrational functions, we'll just come to them. 
The third one is introversion and extraversion. And the last one, according to Jung, dominant life attitude supported by a primary function. Now let's see what they are. So thinking type versus the feeling type. As you can see from the names, the act of thinking type are based on reasons. But the acts of feeling types, they mostly go by their heart. So they act on what's in their heart. Then another one is the sensation type versus the intuition type. Now here by sensation we mean we are influenced by external sensory stimuli. So these people's actions are led by what is there in front of them, what is outside of them and hence external to them. While the intuitive type, they are led by internal feelings which are sometimes undefinable. Then he talked about extroverted versus introverted. Now someone who is introverted focuses on their own mental world. They are withdrawn, isolated, they are more into themselves. Extroverted people on the other hand focus more on the world outside themselves. They get affected by people, they are engaged into conversations. And the last one that he's talked about is dominant life attitude supported by a primary function. Every person has a dominant life attitude and a primary function that characterize them as a certain personality type. That is, on the basis of this attitude, which is a major function, which is a major character of their personality, we can put them into a certain personality type. For example, if the person is introverted, has introverted thinking, or introversion is the dominant life attitude, then he falls in the category of introversion. Now we come to trait approaches. So what are the trait approaches and how they are different from type approaches? So what are traits first of all? Traits may be defined as relatively permanent and relatively consistent general behavior patterns that an individual exhibits in most situations. So if you observe a person in a number of situations, you would see there are certain traits that they tend to do. And we try to define the person's personality on the basis of these traits that we have seen them behaving like or which we see them using time and again. Now traits may be said to be the basic units of a person's personality that can be discovered through the observation of individual's behavior in different situations. So first of all, in trait theories, we talk about Alpert's theory. G. W. Alpert was the first theorist to reject the notion of a relatively limited personality types, which we have just discussed. He proposed the trait approaches for describing highly individualized and unique behavior. He was basically of the view that we cannot decide who falls into which category just because of the basis of certain types which are limited because the behavior of the individual is highly individualized and very very unique. According to Alpert, traits are the basic units of personality. All of us develop a unique set of such organized tendencies termed as traits in the course of development. Now Alpert distinguished three types of traits and what are they? cardinal, central, and secondary. First of all, cardinal traits. These, according to Alpert, are primary traits, that is, the major ones, extremely dominant, very, very important. To an extent that he says these traits overrule every other trait in a human being. But they are limited in number, generally one or two. For example, humorous. Now, if a person is humorous, that means this trait is central to the description of his or her personality. Then are central traits. They represent a few characteristic tendencies of individuals. Usually they are 5 to 10 in number. For example, honesty, kindness, submissiveness and so on. These traits along with the cardinal traits give that uniqueness to personality. And the last one are secondary traits. They are not as dominant as cardinal or central traits. They appear in relatively small number of situations. And they are not considered strong enough to be regarded as integral to personality. These may be regarded as common traits. Why common? Because they may be common with a lots of people. For example, if the situations are normal, most of the people are calm, they are cooperative, they would not create lots of fuss. So these are the traits which are the secondary traits found in general population in normal scenarios. Thus, 
how Alpert defines personality based on all these things. He says personality is the dynamic organization within the individual of those psychophysical systems that determine his characteristic behavior and thought. That is, there is a changing organization, dynamic organization within the individual of certain systems which are both psychological as well as physical. These systems would determine how a person thinks or how a person is going to behave and this defines the personality of the person. Traits give consistency to behavior generally but they are not always fixed. There may be instances of inconsistency. Another concept that Alpert gives us is functional autonomy. That is functions or means which once served a purpose may attain autonomy at a later stage. Initially they are goal oriented. That is they are goal oriented to begin with but later they become functionally autonomous when the goals are attained. For example, if you are hungry, so you would eat something. So your behavior is goal oriented. But if you like what you have eaten, you would tend to eat it again and again. So functional autonomy is attained. You are eating not because you are hungry, but it is giving you happiness. It is giving you satisfaction. It is giving you comfort. Likewise, taking drugs. Initially, the drugs may be taken to reduce pain or to induce sleep. But later on, the person feels good by taking drugs. So he is taking drugs just for the sake of taking drugs. This is the concept of functional autonomy. Now, Alpert did not study individuals in a group. He rather took the individualized approach. That is, individualized approach was utilized to study individuals separately, not in groups. And the focus was on their uniqueness. He again talks about another thing, which is discontinuous nature of the development of personality. That is, while we develop personality, there is not a continuation from childhood to adulthood. What does it mean? It means that what matters during childhood may be different from the values of adolescence or adulthood. Here, if I give you the example of young kids, sometimes or mostly the parents are very important. They value their parents, but they, that may not be necessarily true when they become adults. So this is the discontinuous nature of personality Alport is talking about. He says, once functioning is not constrained by past, so our past may hamper or it may help our future. But the theory has been criticized. This theory is not very clear to study pattern of growth and development from conception till end because he believed in the concept of discontinuous nature. And this does not hold much ground amongst the rest of the theories. So other theories of which give us straight theory, uh, the other one that we would take up now is the Cattell straight theory. Now Cattell was a British born American researcher and he talks about four types of traits, common, unique, surface and source. What are common traits? As the name suggests, they are widely distributed in general population. For example, honesty, cooperation, aggression and so on. But there are unique traits also. And as they are unique, so these are unique to a person we are talking about. And what are they? Temperamental traits, emotional reactions, which are unique to the person. Then there are surface and source traits. Surface traits, which we can see on the surface that is, can be inferred by the manifestations of behavior. For example, curiosity, dependability, tactfulness, etc. And what are source traits? The underlying structures that determine how the behavior would be or what would be shown on the surface depends on the source traits, where the sources are, what is inside of a person, like dominance, superiority, inferiority, dependability, tactfulness, and so on and so forth. Cattell adopted factor analysis technique to attribute dimensions to personality so that behavior can be predicted in a given situation. So what is this factor analysis technique? He took lots of people, he took a large sample, and he observed their behavior, and he formulated a list of around 17,000 traits. This is a huge number. Then he removed synonyms anything that is identical, which means the same thing. All those were removed and finally, after reducing all of them, 
he formed a list of 171 dictionary words. And these 171 words that he called traits, he named them elements. Then he studied correlations in these elements and identified 35 specific groups and called them surface traits. Remember surface traits that we see outside. He again analyzed the surface traits in terms of interrelations and found basic dimensions which he called source traits. That is underlying structures that influence our personality, that influence what we see on the surface. So source traits are most important. And he obtained a total of 16 traits which he called source traits. These are used to predict behavior by employing the following equation. He says the response is the result of S1 plus T1 plus S2 plus T2 plus S3 T3 is equal to Sn Tn. That is it goes on and on where T is the source trait out of those 16 source traits and S is the importance of that trait for the response. Like if we say academic performance is predicted by two source trait. One is intelligence and another is reading habits. Then we say AP that is academic performance is equal to S1 I plus S2 R where I stands for intelligence and R stands for reading habit. Now let us say the ratio of intelligence and reading habits is 5 is to 3. Then AP would be 5 I plus 3 R that is 5 is the importance of intelligence in determining your academic performance and 3 is the importance of how much you read. So reading habits on academic performance. Now 16 basic or source trait dimensions which he arrived at through the process of factor analysis we just talked about, these were named as factors. On the basis of these 16 source traits, he has given us 16 PF intelligence test also. Katil regarded these factors as the building blocks of personality. That is, they help to measure and predict personality. Now, what are these 16 PF? Some of them are reserved versus outgoing, concrete thinking versus abstract thinking, serious versus happy-go-lucky, submissive versus dominant, affected by feeling versus emotionally stable, relaxed versus tensed, self-assured versus apprehensive, practical versus imaginative, and trusting versus suspicious. These are few of them. There are a total of 16 as the name suggests. Other than these, Katil has also taken into account motivational variables like the importance of urges, sentiments, and attitudes while defining our personality. Therefore, the theory has a strong standing amongst the contemporary personality theories. And it also gives importance to both heredity as well as environment. But there is a little criticism of this theory also. First of all, it has been criticized by circularity of the trait concept. What does circularity means? It means that first he observed behavior, then he talked about traits, and finally on the basis of traits, he is again explaining the behavior. So this is a circular circle that he is taking and hence this is a circularity of the trait concept which is not very very desirable. Then excessive emphasis on overt behavior because we are just observing what is outside of the behavior, what he is actually showing and a lots of time this behavior is socially desirable behavior and may or may not be representative of what actually lies inside the individual. And finally, he has given us a projection of a static picture of personality. So with this, we talked about basically type and trait theories of personality today. In type theories, we talked about Hippocrates, Kreshmer, Sheldon and Jung, all of which are very important. And in trait theories, we talked about Alpert's and Cattell theory. I hope it helps you. Thank you.